friends and parishioners of Winston and Gainford, I hope you encounter God, his comfort and insights that enlighten and strengthen hope from these reflections in word, teaching and music. I begin with the reading from Genesis and the story of Joseph. Genesis 45. Then Joseph could no longer control himself before all those who stood by him. And he cried out, Send everyone away from me. So no one stayed with him when Joseph made himself known to his brothers. And he wept so loudly that the Egyptians heard it and the household of Pharaoh heard it. Joseph said to his brothers, I am Joseph. Is my father still alive? But his brothers could not answer him. So dismayed were they at his presence. Then Joseph said to his brothers, Come closer to me. And they came closer. He said, I am your brother, Joseph, whom you sold into Egypt. And now do not be distressed or angry with yourselves because you sold me here. For God sent me before you to preserve life. You must tell my father how greatly I am honoured in Egypt and all that you have seen. Hurry and bring my father down here. Then he fell upon his brother Benjamin's neck and wept, while Benjamin wept upon his neck. And he kissed all his brothers and wept upon them. And after that, his brothers talked with him. Chloe, our preacher last Sunday in St Mary's Gainford, spoke about hope and how God brings good out of bad and is with us through life's twists and turns. She has provided a shortened version for our reflection today. Joseph had endured a lot. After the first terrible thing, when his brother almost killed him, then decided to sell him as a slave. His life was one bad luck situation after another. Through it all, Joseph recognised that God was still with him. God shaped his heart to discover what really mattered to him. He thought about his father and his family. No wonder Joseph could not control himself from weeping his heart out when his brothers finally were there in front of him, 22 years after his first terrible thing. Let us listen to Chloe now. Good morning. Today we're thinking about the Joseph story in Genesis 45. The backdrop to Joseph's story is a time of national disaster and a famine so severe that it threatens the existence of the nation itself. Today is the denouement of the story. After Joseph's uh, rather arrogant early dreams, his brothers leave him for dead in a pit, and then he's sold into slavery, he's falsely accused of rape, and he ends up being in jail for several years. Afterwards, he comes out, he gradually uh, moves up the ranks until he's governor of Egypt. Pretty impressive for someone with a prison record and an immigrant. Today it's the first family get-together after 22 years of separation and jo Joseph's struggling to contain his emotions. He has to send the servants out of the room so he doesn't break down in front of them. The Joseph story is usually read as one of forgiveness and that's clearly the key theme. But it also has some interesting things to say to us in Covid times about God's sovereignty and what happens when bad things happen to good people. Something we might want to note in passing is the importance of having godly people in governance. 
Joseph's wisdom in planning in a time of crisis speaks across the centuries to us. He averts impending disaster because he goes up, stores grain, uses his management skills, assesses the local situation and bases his actions on the best scientific evidence of drought and grain production. Government is a godly occupation. Joseph's ability to act for God stems from his strength of character. And it's really noticeable that this is shown in very small things. When he's in prison for resisting the temptation of Potiphar's wife, he helps out his fellow prisoners. And in this upside-down world where Pharaoh's baker and butler are in prison with him, he helps them by interpreting their dreams. And of course, this helps him later. He had every right to be bitter and uncooperative in jail, but his concern for other people is evident. And in our strange COVID days, it's a good reminder that small acts of goodness and kindness really do count and bring change. I'm struck this week by the news that Benny Tai, the Hong Kong law professor and Christian leader of the Umbrella Movement, has just lost his job uh, while he's still awaiting the outcome of his appeal. He's lost his job basically because of his leadership and support for the rule of law. And his willingness to put his faith into action and his job on the line uh, speaks to us of the self-sacrifice of Christ and very different from those putting their own interests first at the moment. So if Joseph continued to do good in small ways in prison, the second point we might want to think about is his remarkable refusal to be bitter about the past or to hold his brother's sins against them because of his faith in God. He doesn't give his brothers a free pass. He's quite clear. I'm your brother whom you sold into Egypt. He states their wrong to them. But he's faithful and gracious in seeing their actions as part of a bigger picture. It was a little more complex for Joseph than that. And he orchestrates this whole series of tests for his brothers to see how they'd respond to who he now was. And what brings him to tears and enables him to reveal himself to them is the goodness of Reuben uh, and the willingness of his problematic elder brother, Judah, to be a hostage so that uh, Benjamin could return home. And their good acts really give him the impetus to forgive them. But what gives him the greatest strength was his belief that it wasn't really you who sent me here, but God, as he says. His faith in God's sovereign plan to save the nation enables him to come to terms with everything that's happened. The Joseph story should give us pause for thought in an era when lots of people are asking, why would a good God allow a pandemic to happen? Or where is God in all of this? Joseph believed that God had a plan and he rightly saw God at work in his life. But we need to weigh his understanding of sovereignty with one viewed through the lens of Christ. Joseph even saw his own fake murder as the hand of God. We can believe that God is in charge without believing that God wills evil or harm. And we can believe that God works to bring good out of evil without seeing God as the cause of wrong. I've been reading Tom Wright's short book, God and the Pandemic, where he tackles these questions with his characteristic clarity. In his bush book, the former Bishop of Durham dismisses people who would see God's punishment in recent events or who would claim any clear sense of what God is saying through such an event. In Job and his unresolved questions or in Jesus' response to tragedies, the Bible suggests that there are things we just can't know about causation. What matters is what we do and how we respond. When Jesus is asked about the natural disaster of a tower falling and killing 20 people, he doesn't look for the cause, he doesn't look backwards, but looks forwards to what God will do about it. The Joseph story, as Bishop Tom notes, can be used to answer those who say it's sin that caused this. Famine wasn't anybody's sin in the Genesis account, and Joseph is clearly not responsible for his own downfall. The death and destruction of Covid shouldn't directly be seen as a result of God's judgment either, despite the many who rushed to see it as punishment for sin or some sign of the end times. We don't have to go to the other extreme either of the eco-fascist answer that the earth is culling people to rebalance itself in order to acknowledge that human greed and sin has had a place and a cause in this, the trafficking of species, habitat destruction, which are believed to be part of the cause of the pandemic. 
There are two keynotes in a right response to tragedy that we get from looking at Jesus. The first is a deeper understanding of what it means to say that God is in control. Jesus redefines what this means for us. As Bishop Tom says, God isn't some medieval monarch directing every action of his people. When Jesus faced death and loss at Lazarus' graveside, he prays real tears and shares in the human grief, even though he knows that God is sovereign. Sovereignty for Jesus is about healing and forgiveness, breaking bread and dying on the cross, not about wielding some coercive power or absolute authority. In Romans, Paul speaks of the groaning of creation as it waits for the end of this death and destruction. And Paul writes that God works with and through those who love him to bring things to good. So our response might be twofold, to ask what can we do practically to help those affected, to see where God is at work going forward and to join the poor in spirit and the mourners in being sent out to do God's work, of bringing good to a bad situation of working for a renewed creation. The other mainstay to our response will be lament, of lamenting, of groaning wordlessly with creation and with God's spirit as we contemplate the tragedy unfolding across the world. Lament expresses our unknowing and our powerlessness, but also our hope. Coronavirus is a time when we are like Joseph in exile. We're not in control. It's a time to fast, to pray and to mourn for the world and to sit alongside God's spirit and to hold the world in silent prayer. Amen. Have you ever felt like nobody was there? Have you ever felt forgotten in the middle of nowhere? Have you ever felt like you could disappear? Like you could fall and no one would hear? It's a dark and lonely place when life seems to have dealt you a bad hand. And even those who are supposed to love you seem to have let you down. If you or someone you know is in that place, pray with these words from Pope Francis and ask God to refresh your heart and trust God to take you to the place where you are found of God. You can have flaws, be anxious, and even be angry. But do not forget that your life is the greatest enterprise in the world. 
Only you can stop it from going bust. Many appreciate you, admire you, and love you. Remember that to be happy is not to have a sky without a storm, a road without accidents, work without fatigue, relationships without disappointments. To be happy is to find strength in forgiveness, hope in battles, security in the stage of fear, love. In discord, it is not only to enjoy the smile, but also to reflect on the sadness. It is not only to celebrate the successes, but to learn lessons from the failures. It is not only to feel happy with the applause, but to be happy in anonymity. Being happy. Is not a fatality of destiny, but an achievement for those who can travel within themselves. To be happy is to stop feeling like a victim, and become your destiny's author. It is to cross deserts, yet to be able to find an oasis in the depths of your soul. It is to thank God for every morning, for the miracle of life, even your life. God of truth, light, and love, free me from this place of disappointment and despair. Fill me anew with your breath of life. In Jesus' name, Amen. Amen.